going to record. Well, hi there and welcome to our Bible study on the life of Jesus Christ. We're actually going to be using a book called The Life of Christ from the Smart Guide to the Bible series written by Robert C. Gerard, who is a commentator that I've read or shared a few times now on the server. It's interesting <clears throat> to think that Jesus was not only fully man, but he was also fully God. And I wanted to explore that a little bit, especially since we're just under a week from Easter. But before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, yesterday was Palm Sunday. Yesterday, we celebrated Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on that of a colt, a donkey colt, where people laid down palm leaves for him, shouting, Hosanna. Hosanna is the king. And Lord, as we look forward to <clears throat> celebrating your resurrection and the day that you have set aside for that, we also know, Lord, that we're celebrating the day that you were crucified. And I personally have always found that to be a very difficult day. It's good for me, but it was difficult for you. And so I want to offer you our thanks and our praise for all that you've done for us. And I want to pray, Lord God, for each one on the server and each one who's in the study today, that you would open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, our minds to receive the words that you have for us. Help us, Lord God, to focus on you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, <clears throat> Some of you know, maybe all of us, that in about 5 BC, there were two special baby boys born in the land of Israel. And they were cousins. We can read about that in Luke 136. One was born into the priestly clan of Aaron, and the other though born into poverty, was from the royal line of David. And they were born six months apart. And an angel sent from God predicted both births. And each set of parents was told that in the plan of Almighty God, their son was slated to be a man of destiny. I wonder if anyone knows who these two individuals were. But each would have a very short time to minister. But these two men were part of a strategy to bring the grace of God to all people. <clears throat> the lives of both, by the way, would end violently in their early 30s. The first would be beheaded. The second would be crucified. The first would be known as the greatest prophet ever born. The second would be known as the son of God, the only begotten of the father. The first would introduce the second to the world, then fade from the scene. The second would sit on the throne of a never-ending kingdom. In the Bible, the life of Christ begins with the birth stories of these two men whose lives and destinies were so intertwined. And we look first at John 1, 14, New King James Version. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, when the only begotten of the Father was born into the human family, 
in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Israel was under the thumb of another in the long series of foreign armies that oppressed its citizens for seven centuries, 700 years. The Romans ruled with a fist of iron and they brought with them such big government blessings as heavy taxation, poverty, and martial law. And of all the Roman Empire's conquered peoples, the Jews were the most zealous for freedom. They were programmed by the promises of God to consider only national sovereignty and personal liberty, the norm. And centuries of oppression had failed to take the edge off their yearning to be free. So this little section here is called Come, O Come, Emmanuel, I-M-M-A-N-U-E-L. Sometimes we see it as Emmanuel, but in this case, Emmanuel. God's or sorry, Israel's obsession with national, sovereign, national sovereignty rose from the belief that God would send a deliverer from King David's royal family to drive the conquerors into the sea and establish an eternal government that would end slavery, poverty, and oppression forever and bring Israel to prominence among the nations. <clears throat> Excuse me, in ancient prophecies, messages from God about the present and future found the fire of hope. God himself created the yearning for freedom and national sovereignty by promising the Messiah. You see in Hebrew, the Messiah, or Messiah, the word Messiah means anointed one. And in Greek, the word is translated Christ. So there's some samples of Old Testament promises of the coming king. In Genesis 49.10, the promise of the king is the nations will obey the scepter bearer, Shiloh, a member of Judah's clan. In Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, God will give Israel a prophet like Moses who will speak God's words. 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 to 16, one of King David's offspring will reign forever. Isaiah 7, verse 14, a young woman will bear a son who will be called Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, a native son of Israel will establish an eternal kingdom of peace, justice, and righteousness. Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 4. The anointed one will end oppression, mend heartbreak, free captives, and proclaim God's favor. And then Ezekiel 37, verses 21 to 28. Israel will be restored to its homeland, and a king called David will rule forever. Find that kind of interesting. By the way, Shiloh was one to whom tribute or obedience belongs. Judah descended from the third son of Jacob, father of Israel's leading tribe. The word Emmanuel means God with us. Anointed means chosen for kingly, priestly, or prophetic authority. Favor, God's favor, refers to grace, loving kindness, mercy. And David, in Ezekiel 37, was used here as a figurative title for Messiah King. So we'll go to Luke 1, verses 5 to 7. <clears throat> There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was one or was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. 
and they were both well advanced in years. So you see, they, he was a Jewish man, Zacharias, and they were well advanced in years and they honestly had given up hope of conceiving. And because they and the people around them believed faithful servants of God would be blessed with children, this was really hard to understand because they had been faithful. And to face the declining years without children and grandchildren to care for them was disappointing and cause for anxiety. Why was that? <clears throat> well, part of the reason, and if you had been in our Luke Bible study, you would know this, that what actually happened in Jewish culture back then is that if a family was considered childless, you see, they didn't have social services, they didn't have, you know, seniors, care homes, etc. There was no one to look after you in old age. So that was the first point. But the second point was that if somebody didn't have children, or if someone gave birth to someone who had a disability, such as, you know, we often read about a beggar in scripture, or, you know, someone who's blind, etc. It was thought by Jewish people back then, that the family was being punished for some sin in script, you know, back in, in those days in their family might not have been them directly. It might not have been the individual directly, but it was someone in the family or some sort of family sin that they believed this, which of course is devastating to anybody. But Zecharias, and I've heard him call Zechariah also, and Elizabeth, were two of the good guys, you see, because they kept the hope of the promised Messiah alive in their hearts. And in Luke 1, 6, we read that they were both righteous before God, and they observed all God's commandments and all his ordinances blame, or blamelessly. Now, to explain, Zacharias was a priest in the temple, and that meant that every so often, according to the schedule, he was called upon to do priestly duties in the temple. So during a priestly's division or priestly divisions period of service at the temple, specific tasks were assigned by lot, which was actually drawing straws or throwing dice to settle an issue. But I've seen an image a drawing where it was actually rocks with writing or, you know, that had been engraved on them. But one of the most honored jobs was burning incense, which represented prayers rising to God. And Zacharias won the coveted assignment. So when it came time to burn incense, the old priest was left alone inside the holy place in the temple. And that's the second most sacred room in the temple, by the way. So all the others were outside with the other worshipers praying. And at the signal, Zacharias burned the sweet smelling stuff on the altar of incense just outside the veil that covered the Holy of Holies from view. And the veil was a thick curtain barring the way into the Holy of Holies. So to Zacharias, this was probably that mountaintop experience of his life. But he had no idea just how high the mountaintop was going to be. Because as the sweet smelling smoke wafted heavenward, a being straight out of heaven suddenly stood right there beside the incense altar. A bolt of terror shot through Zechariah's old frame. He braced himself for death. But the angel's first words disarmed his fear. In Luke 1, 13, do not be afraid, Zacharias. You see, the angel wasn't there to terminate the faithful priest, but to deliver some good news. So to Zacharias' practical mind, the news that he and Elizabeth would become parents was just too good to be true. 
I mean, there were limits even to what a believer like him could believe, especially considering he was an old man and his wife was no spring chicken. Zacharias's faith needed proof. So the angel gave him proof. Zacharias emerged from the temple speechless. And usually the incense offering was followed by a benediction for waiting worshipers, but the old priests could only gesture. They concluded he'd seen a vision in Luke 1, verse 22. So Zacharias completed his week of temple duties, and then he went home to his wife in the hills of Judea. We read about that in Luke 1, 39. And although speechless, Zacharias could only write in verse 63. He probably wrote every detail of his experience for Elizabeth to read, including the child's name. So upon discovery she was pregnant, Elizabeth went into five months of seclusion, not because there was any shame in pregnancy, exactly the opposite. Among Jews, childbearing was a cause for celebration. To be childless was a tragedy. Some considered it punishment by God. Elizabeth had endured put downs from people who failed to recognize what a godly person she was. And maybe she wanted to be sure that when she told the neighbors she was pregnant, it showed. The fact is we don't really know. Now, my husband and I had friends for quite a lot of years in our marriage. And they've moved away and we've moved away and we're quite far apart from each other now. but. They got married when they were older. They were, I think, 39-ish when they were married. And she was 45 when she learned that they were pregnant. And it was quite a shock. They had not thought that they would ever bear a child. And it was really hard for my, our friends, especially for the mother and the wife, because when she would go to events with her daughter, you know, at the church or more so at school and that sort of thing, or was seen at the playground, they very often thought that she was her grandmother, which wasn't the case. And that's really kind of a shame. But it was obvious that she was older. So I can understand how Elizabeth must have felt. Now in Luke 1, verses 26 to 28, we read, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. You see, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the same angel who met Zechariah in the temple visited the town of Nazareth in Galilee. And once again, we overhear a private conversation, this time between the angel Gabriel and a young woman named Mary. Gabriel's greeting indicates that Mary had a relationship with God that was alive and well. So if the angel's greeting troubled Mary in verse 29, she must have felt the wind knocked out of her when he got to the main message he'd come to deliver. It was enough to send any teenage girl into panic. And I think today about the stigma of unwed mothers. And oh, yes, in some areas of our world, there is still quite the stigma. But back then, it would be almost unheard of. You see, God's man Gabriel wisely paved the way with the encouraging word that she need not be afraid because God was on her side and was about to do her a high favor. The news that changed Mary's life forever was that she was about to become pregnant and give birth to a boy to whom she was to give the name Jesus, meaning Savior. In Luke 1.34, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? 
since I do not know a man? So good question. Mary may have been young, but she knows the facts of life. And it was going to be a while before she and Joseph completed their engagement period and consummate their marriage. So she's never been intimate with him or any other man. And without that, how can she conceive the promised child? Mary seems to understand that conception of her special baby will take place immediately and that no man will be involved. So unlike Zacharias, who couldn't believe without further certification of the angel's prophecy in verse 18, Mary is simply puzzled about how what is about to happen will happen. No problem. Gabriel answers your question with the delicate reserve. One, the Holy Spirit will come on you or come upon you in Luke 135. You see, it's a, ma a mistake to imagine some sort of mating between the Holy Spirit and Jesus. Or sorry, try that again between the Holy Spirit and Mary. Jesus uses these same words to describe the entrance of the Holy Spirit into the lives of his disciples on the day of Pentecost. It's a way of saying the conception of Jesus in the womb of the Virgin was an act of God. In other words, a miracle. And two, the power of the highest will overshadow you in Luke 1 35. In scripture, God's presence is often indicated by the appearance of an overshadowing cloud. The presence and power of God himself would perform a totally new act of creation in her womb to produce a holy child free from sin of any kind. So the virgin birth of Jesus Christ is the root from which everything the New Testament says about him grows. Theologians and ordinary men struggle with it, but to the mind willing to believe nothing is impossible with God, it's not at all hard to accept. Both Luke and Matthew state it up front as a fact, which they're convinced explains the unusual nature of the man Jesus and the amazing things he said and did. Eugene H. Peterson wrote, this profound mystery is presented to us very simply. God comes to us in Jesus Christ in the simplest form as an infant. And John F. MacArthur Jr. wrote, the virgin birth is an underlying assumption of everything the Bible says about Jesus. To throw out the virgin birth is to reject Christ's deity. The accuracy and authority of scripture and a host of other related doctrines that are the heart of the Christian faith. You see, no issue is more important than the virgin birth to our understanding of who Jesus is. If we deny Jesus as God, we have denied the very essence of Christianity. Kind of an interesting thought. So after her unconditional surrender to the will of God in Luke 138, Mary needs time to process all she's been told and to prepare for the months ahead. So she hurries from the well-watered grassy hills of Galilee to the desert dry hills of Judea for a visit with her relative Elizabeth. And the angel Gabriel had cited Elizabeth's pregnancy as proof to Mary that with God, nothing will be impossible in Luke 1, verses 36 and 37. You see, Elizabeth would understand. Aside from Elizabeth's husband, Zacharias, Mary may have been the first to see the older woman since she became pregnant six months earlier and entered her self-imposed seclusion. The exchange that took place upon Mary's arrival was astonishing. 
First, the baby in Elizabeth's womb jumped at the sound of Mary's greeting. Elizabeth interpreted the fetal leap as the unborn prophet's joyful recognition of the mother of the unborn child. Now, I have heard many times over, for any of you hoping to have children at some point in your life later on, whether you're a guy or a, a girl and you know, just that you, when you marry, you know, the, the person that God has for you, that this might well, you know, be something that the Lord blesses you with. But I've heard tell that people speak or that mothers, fathers speak or play music or read scripture to the baby in the womb and that it does indeed affect that baby. So, here, the baby in Elizabeth's womb jumped at the sound of Mary's greeting. And Elizabeth interpreted that fetal leap, as it was called, as the unborn prophet's joyful recognition of the mother of the unborn Christ. And the second is the Holy Spirit gave Elizabeth exactly the words Mary needed to hear, reassuring her that. What was happening to her was a result of God's grace and blessing and that her faith would be rewarded. Thirdly, Elizabeth acknowledged the divine origin of Mary's unborn child, calling him my Lord. Then in Luke 1, verses 46 to 48, we read, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant and behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed or blessed. You see, upon Elizabeth's greeting, Mary broke into a singing, a joyful poem of worship, part of which we just read. Christians call it the Magnificat. The song magnifies the saviorhood of God and puts the arrival of the Messiah in a revolutionary perspective. The arm of the Lord is an Old Testament reference to the promised Messiah, the Christ child that Mary was carrying. She says that God has shown strength with his arms and has scattered the good in the imagination of their hearts in Luke 1, 51. She sees his arrival as continuing God's program in the present and the future. And the specific deeds that she mentions fulfill the revolutionary longings of the Jewish people. And for that matter, anyone who was oppressed. Mary's boy will ignite the fires of a most unusual revolution. Then in Luke 1, 57 to 58, we read, now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered and she brought forth a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. You see, Jewish law prescribed that baby boys should be circumcised the eighth day after birth. The practice is a little bit different today. I actually have a Jewish e friend. I haven't talked to him for a little while, but they do still do the uh, circumcision on the eighth day, but they very often give the baby a little bit of Tylenol, which is not something they did back then, of course. And so among first century Jews on the day of circumcision, the child was also named. And without consulting the parents, presumptive relatives picked a family name. So why bother trying to talk to old Zacharias about anything? He was deaf and dumb as a post in Luke 1 20. And the boys should, if they decided to be named Zacharias after his father. But Elizabeth shouted no over the cacophony of noisy kinfolk. He shall be called John the name the angel gave him in Luke 1, verse 13. And that was unheard of. So they went to Zechariah's and with a lot of arm waving, asked him for the final word. And his handwritten answer 
was more emphatic than his wife's. His name is John. In Luke 1.63, obedience to the angel's instruction dis demonstrated the old priest's faith. The last shred of doubt in John 1 verse 18 disappeared along with his ability to speak. Once he and his faith or had his faith in his tongue back, Zacharias' speech returned when he named the child John, according to the angel's instructions. So Zacharias praised the Lord for keeping his promises in verses 67 to 7, or sorry, 68 to 75. And he prophesied about his son's place in God's redemptive plan in Luke 1, verses 76 to 79. So like Mary Magnificat, or her Magnificat, Zacharias' song has been set to music, and it's called the Benedictus. And we're not going to examine it, but there are a few sort of similarities there. But Zacharias and Elizabeth's boy grew up in the desert. We learn about this in Luke 180. And he spent 30 years preparing for the strategic task of introducing Jesus, his cousin, to Israel when it was time for Jesus to begin his messianic ministry. Jesus would one day say of John, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. In Luke 7, verse 28. So that takes us to the end of our first chapter. It's kind of interesting to sort of understand the relationship between Jesus and John the Baptist, between Mary and Elizabeth, and Joseph, and Zecharias, and all that took place. So I'm going to end for now, and we'll carry on with the next chapter next week. But I pray that as we're looking at this, it may be very familiar to you. You may even know more than I know about this. But I wanted us to start from the very beginning and work our way through it. Because too often we rush through scripture and we miss something that the Lord might have for us. So, Father, I thank you that today, as we study your word, little bit by little bit, that you will speak into our hearts and minds, that you will make whatever changes in our life you so desire. And that we would serve you with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.